and I'd like to thank everyone for uh, coming and watching Hacker Hot Shots in the evening. Um, we have Jeremy Faircloth, who is a security professional and author, um, who has agreed to come on Hacker Hot Shots tonight to offer a presentation called How to Perform a Basic System Scan and Exploit XSS. Uh, and this is really um, part of a um, you know an element of a course that Jeremy has created called the Applied Penetration Testing uh, Level 1, L1 course. Uh, and um, Jeremy, first off, thank you very much for, uh, for, for taking, to, taking your time and coming to, on to Hacker Hotshots. I appreciate it. Thank you, Max. Excellent. So, Jeremy, before we, we get into the, the, the demonstration, can you briefly explain what your um, Applied Penetration Testing L1 course teaches and who you created it for? Sure, absolutely. The, the Applied Penetration Testing course uh, was uh, kind of evolved over time as I've been teaching uh, a lot of people about how to do basic penetration testing. And the course is designed, uh, the Level 1 course is designed for people who are wanting to get into the penetration uh, testing uh, specialty of IT security. People who may not uh, have a lot of experience in that area but uh, want to gain more experience and learn how to do penetration testing the right way and covering it uh, from, the, from the ground up. Very basic uh, all the way into more advanced techniques as uh, we get into level two and level three courses. Terrific. Okay, so let's get into the, let's get into the demo. Um, if you can pull that up on your uh, desktop. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to disappear from the screen view, but uh, I will be uh, I'll be listening in, and if you need anything, just holler. Okay. Okay, absolutely. So uh, this demo is on how to uh, use some basic tools uh, within the uh, Backtrack Linux uh, distribution uh, to uh, do a system scan and uh, identify uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Uh, what I'm using here for the scan is a uh, modified version of the uh, Backtrack 5 R2 uh, Linux distribution. Uh, Backtrack 5 uh, R2 is a, a Linux distribution that's oriented for IT security professionals. It's uh, designed uh, to allow for uh, a large number of uh, vulnerability scanning tools, exploitation tools, system scanning tools uh, to be in a single easy to use uh, image that uh, can be portable and used in a couple of places. The Lab Edition is a, a modified version that includes a number of virtual machines uh, within the Backtrack Linux uh, image itself. So you have an isolated network with a number of systems. If you look here on the left, there's Run Lab 1, Lab 2, and a Shutdown Lab icon. Those are specific to the uh, Lab Edition, and they're used for, uh, built for starting up and uh, operating this lab environment, this internal lab environment. So within the, uh, the Linux distribution, we have a number of virtual machines. We'll start them up by uh, hitting uh, Run Lab 1 over here. These uh, virtual machines will uh, start up. If you look on the uh, uh, taskbar there, there's a, a number of X-term sessions that are starting up. All of these are uh, basically console um, uh, sessions for the virtual machines that are starting up in the background. Each of these virtual machines have uh, a different function. Uh, all of them have uh, various vulnerabilities uh, that can be used for testing out uh, your skills, testing out the, uh, the tools within the Backtrack Linux uh, distribution. So if you look here, we've got a DMZB, DMZA, uh, firewall, uh, INTA. All of these are the uh, virtual machines that start up uh, with the uh, Lab 1 instance. So what we're going to do uh, for this demo uh, initially is uh, go ahead and open up a, a terminal session. We're going to start uh, looking around to, to see what our network looks like internally. We'll start with an IF config uh, to see which uh, interfaces uh, we have uh, enabled on this system. Looks like we've got an ETH0, which uh, calls back to the virtual machine network. We have a loopback adapter. And we've got uh, TAP0, uh, which goes to a 10.5.0.1 network. That is the internal uh, lab uh, environment network uh, that's been built up of these virtual machines uh, within, the, uh, within the image, within the, uh, the lab edition. As you can see with the uh, net mess there, uh, this is defined as a uh, class C uh, subnet. So uh, what we're going to look at first is this uh, 10.5.0 network and uh, see what hosts uh, we have available there. So we'll be using the, uh, the nmap tool for that, just basically doing a very uh, uh, quick ping scan. We'll uh, set that up with the uh, dash sp option, then uh, specify the uh, the subnet or the network that we're looking at, 10.5.0.0. .0 .0. 
and then a, uh, a subnet mask of slash 24 to specify class C. We'll kick up the speed here of uh, NMAP with the dash T5 option since this is all an internal network and we can run our ping scan very quickly. So we're running through the scan here. As you can see, the initial report indicates that uh, there's a uh, host uh, 10.5.0.1. Uh, obviously, that's uh, our internal testing system, uh, the uh, IP address assigned to tab 0. And there's another host at uh, 10.5.0.254. In this environment, uh, that's a firewall uh, separating us from uh, other segments of the uh, internal virtual network. So not a, not, a lot of, not a lot of hosts here uh, that we can use for uh, demonstration purposes. So what we'll need to do is kind of discover what, what else this uh, system has access to. Uh, bringing up the routing table here, you can see there's also a 10.5.1.0 and a 10.5.2.0 uh, network that's accessible to us uh, that have entries in the routing table. Again, uh, this is a uh, isolated safe environment, so these are safe networks to scan. We do the same thing with a uh, ping scan, and we use the 10.5.1 uh, network for this one and see what we can find here. Again, uh, we'll run this fairly quickly uh, using the uh, dash T5 option to speed it up. Now with this, we've identified a couple of additional hosts. We've got 10.5.1.10 and 10.5.1.11, uh, in addition to the uh, firewall host at uh, .254. So our next step uh, is to uh, do a little bit of enumeration and uh, determine a little bit more information about these uh, two potential hosts on the, uh, on the network. So uh, we'll run another in-map scan, and this time we'll specify the uh, dash SV option uh, to list out the services that are available as well as their versions uh, for these two hosts. And we'll just specify uh, uh, .10 and uh, .11 so we can uh, run through the, uh, the service scan fairly quickly without uh, you know, putting out a lot of packets on the network here. So as that uh, scan is running, uh, it's going to identify uh, what ports are uh, open on those systems. We're just doing a basic scan, uh, so it's going to uh, scan for a lot of uh, well-known ports and kind of see uh, what exists out there. So we've got information back on uh, both hosts. On the .10 uh, device, it looks like we've got an open HTTP port, and it is running uh, Apache. The uh, version number is listed there as well. And on .11, it looks like uh, we've got uh, some uh, FTP services available. So since we're focusing specifically Typically on cross-site scripting uh, for this particular demo, uh, the uh, host we'll uh, start taking a look at then is uh, 10.5.1.0. That'll be the, uh, the host that we uh, start doing some of our uh, additional testing on. So let's just pull that up here real quick and conquer and uh, see what that site is. Uh, a lot of uh, information about a website can be seen just by pulling it up once in a browser and uh, taking a look at what information you have available. So again, this is on our safe internal network. Uh, this isn't hitting any external systems. It's not putting any uh, traffic outside of the, uh, the image itself. So as we look at this page, there are a number of links that are available on here. Uh, looks like uh, there's a uh, row at the uh, top there that has a number of different uh, uh, sites that it goes to. Uh, looks like most of those are PHP pages. So we were dealing with uh, PHP here. If we go down the left-hand side, uh, we see uh, this news page PHP uh, looks like it's using an ID number to identify various articles. Um, again, specifying a, uh, a number there uh, versus any other data. So that's something we can potentially use. Same thing here with this artpage.php. As we continue to look through the site, <clears throat> we see some links to the PHP pages. And then we've got this author's PHP here. And it has a uh, ID field as well. But instead of a number, that one's actually using values, uh, like Night Ranger in this case, and uh, other values down here a little bit lower, uh, instead of an identifier number. So it looks like uh, what's being specified in the ID is actually being passed back uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the field there. So that's something we can uh, potentially take a look at. And we've got a couple of pages identified here that uh, we can do some, uh, some scans on to see if there are any vulnerabilities we want to take a look at. Again, we're focusing on uh, cross-site scripting here. Uh, so we're going to use uh, some tools that are specific to uh, cross-site scripting. Um, in this case, we're going to be using uh, XSSER. Uh, this is a tool that is uh, very focused, uh, specific for cross-site scripting. So we'll go ahead and pull that up. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a, a basic scan against a couple of different pages that we identified just by uh, looking at the, uh, the website here. If you look in this directory, we've got uh, XSSER. This is going to be the, uh, the application that we, uh, we run, uh, that we use for the scan. And the uh, command line syntax on this is uh, pretty straightforward. So 
Um, for this particular scan, we'll just run it with uh, the, uh, the command there, XSSAR. We'll uh, specify the URL using the dash U parameter and just put in 10.5.1.10. And then uh, we can use either git or post. We want to do a git uh, scan here in this particular case. And uh, we'll put in the uh, exact page here. Uh, we'll start with the uh, news page PHP. And we'll specify the parameter that we saw there, the uh, ID value, but uh, leave the, the value itself as null. Then I always like to tag on a, a dash V to uh, show me the, the verbose mode. As you can see, the scan runs really fast. We've already got results. It shows that uh, it failed. This was uh, not a, a successful scan. As we look through the, uh, the data here, we can see that uh, there was an attempt to use a injected value in that uh, ID uh, field. If that had been reflected back to us correctly, this would have been identified as a successful scan. We would have seen uh, that uh, there was a success noted uh, by the tool. In this case, uh, it was not successful. So uh, we'll go ahead and run against a, another page here. Uh, that author's PHP page looked uh, pretty tempting. So uh, we'll run our next scan against that page and uh, see what we can find. So again, we'll use very similar syntax and just uh, instead of uh, news page, we'll specify authors, PHP, uh, same variable name uh, with ID, and again, we'll leave that with a null value and turn on verbose mode. And again, results come back very quickly. Uh, the injection did fail. So this is our uh, second test, uh, second failure. In uh, both cases, uh, we don't have any vulnerability identified. So what's important when you're doing any sort of uh, penetration testing is don't overly focus on a single tool. Uh, while we are running XSSER here, uh, there is the possibility that we're missing something because we're over-focused. We're using just a, a single tool for our scan. So our next step, the, uh, the next thing that we, we want to do to kind of move this forward is to use another tool uh, to do another scan against the site. Maybe we'll find some, uh, some other uh, data on that site, some other vulnerabilities. So we'll go here uh, and under the uh, vulnerability assessment tools, we're going to take a, a look at uh, Grindle Scan. Uh, Grindle Scan is a uh, pretty basic uh, assessment tool. It's uh, open source, uh, much like uh, every other tool that's uh, included in the uh, the backtrack distribution. And here, we'll just go ahead and add in a, a base URL of the uh, site that we want to scan in 10.5.1.10. We'll add that in. And then we have to specify a output directory for the report. So we'll just drop that to the desktop here and uh, we'll put it in a, uh, a web test di directory just to isolate it a little bit. Now Grindle Scan uses a number of modules and this particular scan uh, it looks like no modules are selected, that's not true. By default uh, uh, several are uh, selected they just don't show up. So we'll run it with the, uh, the default module selections. This runs a few basic tests. Uh, you can extend out the uh, modules that are selected here and uh, include as many as you want. Uh, what that does is basically test for more things and increase the, uh, the amount of time that your scan is going to take. So a, a scan with Grindle Scan uh, can take anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours to a few days. Uh, in some cases, I've, I've run scans using this tool uh, where I wanted to gain as much information as I could out of a site, but I wanted to do it slowly so I didn't uh, set off any alarms. And in cases like that, the scan can actually uh, take several days. Now while that's running, uh, a point that I really want to reinforce is that when you're doing penetration testing, uh, when you're doing any sort of uh, security related analysis, you can't rely on a single tool. Uh, again, we're using XSSCR uh, to do our very focused, very targeted cross-site scripting uh, scans, but there's a very high probability that those focused tools will miss things. And that's where more generic tools like uh, Grindle Scan uh, can fit. They, they scan for a, a wide variety of uh, different vulnerabilities that could exist in the site. And the, the inverse is also true. Uh, if you're running a, a generic tool such as Grindle Scan to scan a site, you may miss some very uh, targeted uh, vulnerabilities that something like XSSER or um, scanners that are specific to a different uh, type of vulnerability could find. So it's always a good idea to, to run multiple tools, run generic tools, run tools that are very targeted, and uh, identify uh, as many vulnerabilities as you can uh, for a, a particular site. Um, some of the vulnerabilities that you find might be able to be reused. 
Uh, and by that I mean if you find a vulnerability in one area, it may lead to another type of vulnerability uh, in a different area of the site. So as this is running, it's going to identify as many vulnerabilities as it can. Again, just a basic scan. Uh, if we wanted to look for more, we could uh, select more modules. But we'll go ahead and let this run, see what it comes back with. And then uh, if it comes back with anything useful, we can potentially use that to go back to what we were looking at initially, which is uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. The well, scan is finished. We'll go ahead and close out of this, uh, terminate the scan. It takes a couple of seconds uh, to uh, generate the report and uh, close out any threads. When that's done, we'll just go ahead and uh, shut down the, uh, the tool here. And uh, we'll take a look at the uh, report that it generated. Minimize a couple of these windows. Okay, so we have the web test directory here. We've got a report.html file. Really hard to read, so we'll go ahead and highlight all of this so it uh, shows up in a little bit more uh, visible manner here. Uh, so we've got some basic findings, proxy server, uh, some findings from Nick too. It looks like obviously this site has a large number of vulnerabilities. Uh, some are serious, some are not. It looks like we've got a lot of data leakage, uh, a lot of information being presented that probably shouldn't be, some configuration things, some uh, database related things, uh, private IP address leakage, uh, SQL injection, uh, directory content listings, and then of course there's a, a mirror of the website created by the tool. And what's interesting in this is we've got a possible SQL injection vulnerability. Now as we look at this, you'll notice that the, uh, the URL there is authors PHP. That's one of the, uh, the same pages that we were testing previously uh, for uh, cross-site scripting. So the implication there is that this ID parameter is vulnerable to uh, SQL injection. So that's something that uh, we can test out and kind of see how that looks on the, uh, within, the, within the site. So we'll go ahead and close out of this and we'll bring up Conqueror again and uh, take a look at the, uh, the site. What we'll do is just uh, go into this author's PHP. We'll pull up uh, what that page shows us. So again, we see the ID value. We'll go ahead and replace that with a single tick and execute. Now what that's done is it's generated a, a SQL error. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the uh, indicators that there may be a, a SQL injection vulnerability. But what's interesting in this is uh, we added the tick there. Um, you'll see that's also in the error message that was presented in the page itself. What that implies is that uh, it's actually reflecting the uh, data that we input, uh, but only when, it's, when a uh, SQL error is generated. So part of uh, a cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability is the potential of a reflected vulnerability, and that's kind of what this is looking like. So let's go back over to uh, XSSCR here, and uh, we'll run the scan again with uh, author PHP. But instead of a null value, we'll go ahead and uh, add a single tick in here, uh, which will trigger the uh, uh, potential SQL injection vulnerability, but also cause that value to potentially be reflected back to us. When we run that scan, it uh, looks like it did get reflected. Uh, so that implies that this vulnerability does actually exist. We do have a, a cross-site scripting vulnerability, but only when we trigger a, a SQL error. So what we can do uh, next with this is uh, there's a, a command in XSSCR that allows us to uh, truly validate the vulnerability. It's the uh, reverse uh, check option. What this does is it causes the actual uh, injection uh, to take place and forces a redirect over here to localhost on port 19084, uh, which effectively connects back into a uh, temporary web server that XSSCR started. And that was successful. So that means that we were successfully able to inject uh, our own code, our own script, into uh, this uh, vulnerable website and have it reflect back and run that code, uh, run the code that uh, redirected it. So let's just kind of experiment with this a little bit. As you look at the, uh, the reflective uh, nature of this, any value that we type in gets reflected back. So we've got uh, just some random characters here reflecting back in this error message. Now that reflection uh, can be used to execute code. It can be used to do a, a variety of things. So what we'll, uh, what we'll test out next is uh, just adding in uh, a little bit of JavaScript code here and see if uh, that gets uh, reflected and run back as well. We've already proven that it will uh, by uh, use of the XSSCR tool and its uh, uh, reverse check function. But doing this manually will uh, demonstrate how, how easy it is to uh, actually uh, inject uh, code into a site and have it, uh, have it execute. 
So the, uh, the code we'll use here is just a basic JavaScript uh, that uh, will generate a pop-up box. So we'll go ahead and put that in here, uh, put in a, a quote, and then uh, a script tag. We'll put in the alert, which is the function we're calling, and then just a few numbers to show in our little pop-up box. Terminate that line, and then uh, terminate the tag. And when we run this, we should get a pop-up box. There it is, uh, with the, uh, the numbers that uh, we put in. And again, this, this same vulnerability on this particular site can be uh, reused to run any type of code. So all we have to do is uh, get a, our end target, uh, a, a, a user, some, somebody who is going to be actively using the site, to click on a URL that we generate that references this author's PHP and uh, injects this code uh, into the ID field, makes use of this cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability, and it will run within the context of this website. Uh, effectively, HTTPS will continue to work. It'll look fine. It'll look normal. But we can run whatever code we want. We can uh, uh, execute a, a JavaScript-based keylogger and uh, grab their credentials if they're entering in, them into uh, the site here. We can uh, replace content. Um, we can uh, display ads and then uh, generate uh, revenue uh, based on the, uh, the ads. And this isn't very difficult to do. Uh, these are things that uh, you just generate the script for, and you can encode it or not encode it, but generate the script and uh, have it execute whenever anybody clicks on that uh, customized link. So this has been a, a demo of how to find this type of vulnerability. This is something that uh, you do a great deal when you're uh, doing penetration testing, is finding cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. They're very common. It's in the uh, OWASP uh, top 10 of uh, vulnerabilities, and something that uh, happens quite a bit. So you run into a lot of these uh, as you're doing that penetration testing. That's uh, it for the uh, the demo there, Max. Sounds good. Okay, perfect. So, Jonathan, let me first off thank you very, very much for for going through that um, with the viewers. Let me let me ask you: Can you explain the benefits that students will gain after having taken your course? Absolutely. The uh, the course that I've designed, the uh, applied penetration testing course, is designed to teach people how to do uh, basic penetration testing. The level one course starts out very, very basically. shows you how to use a variety of tools like uh, those that I uh, just demonstrated, among many others. It shows you how uh, some, some basics about uh, networking technology, about operating systems, uh, various services. shows you how to do the uh, reconnaissance, uh, scanning, enumeration, some of the stuff that we were doing uh, uh, up front, and then uh, web services scanning we cover a wide variety of uh, topics in this uh, in this training class we cover uh, databases uh, service exploitation uh, how to leverage uh, targets to further your exploitation uh, password attacking all this is covered in the uh, the level one course at a very uh, at a very basic level assuming that you don't have a huge amount of IT security experience, assuming that you haven't been doing penetration testing for 10 or 15 years. This is intended to get people started, uh, to get uh, systems engineers, systems admins, uh, database administrators, um, anybody who needs to understand the concepts behind penetration testing can take this course and get a better idea not only of what penetration testing is and how it works, but how to actually do it in a safe lab environment. Excellent. Do you have a list of features there, um, course features? Do you have something that, that we can pull up? or? Uh, I don't have that in a, uh, an easy-to-pull-up uh, mode. What I can say is what the, the various classes are. Uh, yeah, that would be great. If you could just go okay. through, if you could, if you could review the classes of the topics, that would be terrific. Well, absolutely. So the, the uh, pipe penetration testing level one course is uh, broken up into uh, eight individual lessons, each lesson covering a uh, different core subject area. And the format that that uses is a batch of uh, instruction around the uh, course area that's being covered uh, within the lesson, as well as a homework assignment that allows the, uh, the student to go out and actually test this out within the lab environment, within the safe environment, and uh, go hands-on with the tools to, to learn how they work and to practice. So the, uh, the first lesson is a, an introduction. It uh, shows the, uh, the tool sets that we'll be using. It shows the, uh, the Backtrack Linux uh, Lab Edition. Uh, kind of guides the student through setting up the, uh, the lab, getting it fully functional, getting it working. 
we move on uh, to uh, lesson two where we start going into uh, some basics on uh, IT topics that are necessary uh, for any penetration tester to understand. That's areas around uh, networking, uh, operating systems, Windows and uh, Linux and Unix, uh, various services such as uh, uh, web services, FTP services, DNS, uh, all these uh, higher level application level protocols. Then we move into uh, actual scanning, enumeration, uh, reconnaissance, uh, topics like that uh, in lesson three. Uh, shows how to gather intelligence, uh, learn more uh, about a, a particular target, a network, uh, doing enumeration, understanding uh, services that are running, uh, versions of those services, various things that uh, exist uh, in, your, in your target area uh, for your penetration tests. Uh, lesson four, we uh, focus specifically on uh, web services. Vulnerabilities uh, scanning uh, for uh, web services, how to find uh, uh, different types of vulnerabilities uh, that might exist in uh, web environments. And again, all of this is um, in the homework assignment, all of this is done in a practical manner so that the, uh, the student actually gets to try this out. Uh, moving on to lesson five, we focus on databases and the uh, types of uh, attacks that uh, are possible with databases. Uh, SQL injection is covered there. Uh, we talk about uh, what you can do uh, with SQL injection vulnerabilities. Um, lesson six gets into service exploitation, so talking about uh, backdoors, uh, stack overflows, heap overflows, uh, various vulnerabilities along those lines, as well as how to research vulnerabilities, which is a big part of doing penetration testing. You have to know how to find the information on how to uh, take advantage of a, of a vulnerability. Uh, lesson seven then focuses on uh, leveraging targets that you have compromised, uh, how to add uh, additional files to a compromised system, how to use that host uh, as a, a zombie, for example, uh, how to maintain access to that host, and then how to use things like uh, uh, more complex techniques like SSH tunneling to route through a compromised host to get to another host that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. And then the, uh, the final class for the level one course is around password attacks, uh, different types of uh, authentication mechanisms that could be in place, how to uh, get passwords, uh, uh, information about password hashes, and different types of attacks uh, that uh, can be used against uh, passwords, dictionary attacks, brute force attacks, and then the, uh, the tools that uh, can be used with that. As the student progresses through all eight of these lessons and uh, completes the uh, homework assignments, uh, they'll actually have um, compromised multiple machines within the lab environment. They'll have created SSH tunnels, they'll have cracked passwords. All of the things that I've uh, described in the, uh, the lesson list are uh, actual practical uh, tasks that the student will accomplish in the uh, homework assignments. Awesome. Really, really great. Okay, Jeremy, let me, um, I just want to ask if anyone has questions, if they can uh, put, uh, you know, um, post their questions on the, uh, on the chat box. Um, Jeremy, let me ask you a little bit about yourself. You know, how did you how did you get into information security, and you know, what what led to your uh, you developing this expertise? Sure, I've, I've been in the uh, IT industry uh, for a little bit over twenty years now, uh, starting with uh, working on uh, mainframes, working with uh, networking technologies, and uh, twenty years ago, we we didn't have a whole lot of people that were specializing in IT security related fields. Uh, security was just something that every administrator did. It was something that uh, most uh, IT uh, people focused on uh, was around security and how to secure networks. Um, over time, uh, I, the IT industry has changed. Uh, people have become uh, more specialized. Uh, there's a lot more focus on developers being developers, database administrators being database administrators. And uh, through that, uh, there's evolved this role of security administrators or security specialists. Uh, my own uh, skill set over time has evolved to fit in that skill set, but also fit other areas uh, in the, uh, the overall IT uh, roles. So I've done systems administration, I've done database administration, enterprise architecture, uh, all, of this various, all of these various roles, um, I've also incorporated security into all of them. I've done a lot of uh, focus on IT security uh, itself in a, as a specialized field as well as involvement in the other roles. So my own knowledge has kind of evolved over time. Uh, I've got uh, numerous certifications in the IT security field. I've written uh, multiple books on uh, IT uh, security topics. I've written books on uh, programming, uh, including how to involve security into your programming and into your techniques. 
and I've done a lot of training on IT security related topics, teaching people how to do penetration testing, uh, how, uh, how security is architected in general, security concepts, things uh, like the Security Plus exam, uh, the CISSP, uh, various uh, exams like that, what, what a student would need to know to pass those exams, and not only that, but have the real knowledge they need to execute in the, in the workplace. Terrific! You're a legend. Let me, uh, <laughs> let me, let me, let me see. I've got a couple of questions that have come through. Um, what's uh, Jeremy? What's the main difference between XSS or CSRF? So with uh, with cross site scripting, um, there's there's a number of different types of cross site scripting, right? So for a, a uh, XSS uh, vulnerability, what we're specifically looking for is uh, injecting uh, code and having it execute. So you can do this in a number of ways. Uh, what I demonstrated here is uh, reflective uh, cross-site scripting. Uh, that's where you insert the code and have it reflected back in the, uh, in the response uh, from the website. Uh, there's also uh, stored uh, cross-site scripting where you insert uh, 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 your inject your uh, you inject your code your script into a stored area this is something where the uh, the script itself will get stored in a database uh, this is common with uh, with forums uh, where there isn't uh, proper uh, cleanup of any incoming data it'll store the actual malicious code uh, and then display it when someone goes back to that site and uh, views a news article for example and then uh, you've also got uh, the uh, DOM-related uh, cross-site scripting, uh, where code is injected uh, through uh, some of the uh, the DOM headers of the uh, of the actual web page as it, as it comes up. So th there are a number of different types of, of cross-site scripting uh, that that exist and that can be leveraged. This demo was just focused specifically on uh, reflective uh, cross-site scripting. Okay. Um, let me see here. Should we tell our employees to use the NoScript add-on by Mozilla, i.e., the XSS blocker? Well, when when you're uh, referring to uh, telling your employees to use something, that kind of depends on the uh, the technical level of your employees and then the the sites that they're accessing. Um, if a lot of the the uh, sites that they access uh, do need to have uh, scripts. Uh, if any of the uh, the, the corporate uh, websites, uh, for example, if you're running a uh, employee relationship management system, if any of that uses uh, scripts and uh, the the employee needs to execute those, you don't want to shut off their ability to do their job or their their ability to access internal websites. Uh, if you're looking specifically for protecting them from uh, external uh, threats, then it's certainly not a bad idea. Uh, there have been a number of um, vulnerabilities discovered over the last few months uh, with uh, Java or with, uh, with other uh, uh, scripting engines. So blocking scripts is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but on the other hand, it can interfere uh, with uh, actual job functions for employees. So it kind of depends on what they need to do. Uh, if they don't have anything that uh, needs to run scripts, block scripts. If, uh, if they do, uh, then you, you need to look at uh, methods to uh, block scripts in the right place and allow scripts in, uh, in other places, for example, uh, only uh, over the intranet. Okay. Um, another question came in. It says, sometimes I get a um, cross-site scripting. Sometimes I get a message on my screen saying that Internet Explorer just stopped working. Is someone trying to get into my system? Well, uh, we are talking a uh, Microsoft product here with Internet Explorer, so uh, I'm going to leave my own prejudices aside there and say that it could just be an error in the uh, in the application that's causing that. Right. Uh, that that error can be caused by by a number of things. Um, it's unlikely anybody is uh, intentionally trying to hack your system, but it is possible that you've run across a, a website that has uh, malicious code, or just run across a, uh, a bug uh, either within Internet Explorer or within one of the plugins uh, that's running within uh, Internet Explorer. Um, most frequently, based on the, uh, the improvements to uh, Microsoft's testing strategy over the years, most frequently a, a crash will be caused by a, a third-party module of some type. Terrific. Excellent. Jeremy, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate you taking time out and showing us, uh, you know, showing us uh, the, the, you know, this demo and, and, and answering questions and, and walking through the, you know, the, the course syllabus, in essence, for the uh, Applied Penetration Testing L1 course. 
Um, so um, to everyone who's watching, we will be just, you know, this will be sent out. We'll send a, a recorded copy of the video out to everybody. And if you have any follow-up questions, you can get in touch with me and I can pass those questions on to Jeremy. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, for coming to watch. So thanks, Jeremy, as well. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.